I'm Professor Ray Lawrence. I'm a Professor of Roman History and Archaeology at the University of Kent. What I want to talk about is how migration and mobility was a fundamental feature of the Roman Empire some 2,000 years ago, and how a society without rapid transport of trains, planes, automobiles, etc., could exist and be highly mobile and mobility to be a central core feature of the Roman state. Now this is kind of a difficult thing for us to grasp. If we wanted to travel from our campus in Canterbury to Rome today, we go to an airport and we get on an aeroplane and we get there, or we might drive there. However, some people each day leave Canterbury on a pilgrimage to Rome across the Via Franca Genia. One of our students, former students, Julia Peters, did exactly this last year. And this project took her 90 days to carry out. Walking on average 30 kilometres per day, she had to arrange stopping places in advance so that she had to get there. There was no choice on each day whether she might not get to the place she was staying the next day. If it was 35 kilometres away, she had to walk 35 kilometres. An obstacle was the Alps, which even in June can still have snow and avalanches and the Great St Bernard Pass. And in winter, has up to 20 metres of snow in it and can be minus 15 to minus 30 Celsius. It is one of the great obstacles to transport in the Roman Empire. Now, if we're thinking about this topic intellectually, we have to go back to John Urey's book, Mobilities and the mobilities paradigm which he put forward for sociology. The mobilities paradigm is quite simple, but it's beautifully simple. The simplicity makes it such a powerful model, whereby the movement of people, things, ideas is embedded in society. It's not something which is abstract, it defines society. So, for instance, today in Europe, freedom of movement is a fundamental thing of the European Union. And also, for anything to do with human rights and the UN, it's written right into Clause 13. So for us, looking at the Roman Empire, we might be able to get a new insight into the Roman Empire by looking at mobility and how the state promoted mobility. One of the slightly unbelievable facts which is coming out of the study of skeletons in archaeology at the moment is that almost 30% of the population of late Roman Britain, 3rd and 4th century AD Roman Britain, were born outside the British Isles. This compares with about 13% today. So the Roman Empire, we might say, has a huge migration. Migration is a feature of human history. And if we look at Italy, we actually identify families moving rather than an old-fashioned model where the second son might be, might be a migrant. What we're seeing in Rome is we're seeing migration of whole families to Rome. So we have migration, but what we want to understand as well is how the Roman state promotes mobility. And looking at particularly at the actions of the Roman emperors. The first emperor, Augustus, from 27 BC through to AD 14, his long reign is characterised by many things. But the first year of the first emperor's reign we find in Rimini is set up this arch. You can go and see it today. You can go and see bridges on the Via Flaminia as well, built at this time. But this bridge has an inscription at the top. And on it, we see that Augustus restores the famous roads of Italy. Already by 27 BC, Italy is famous for its roads. And this action is commemorated on coins, it's added to. So a feature of Augustus being emperor is that he restores this road. He restores the state, he restores the roads as well in this same year. Now the scale of infrastructure in the Roman Empire is phenomenal. These bridges and also the viaduct on the top right hand side show you how, what a major undertaking this is. We have roughly a thousand Roman bridges surviving today. Many more survived before the Second World War. And we also find that very straight roads, we have roads in mountains, we also have tunnels. So every sort of infrastructure is there, leading across Europe, in North Africa, and right to the Red Sea. 
There are also 8,000 milestones, and these come from North Africa, from Britain, from Asia Minor and Turkey. We have them from everywhere. They set out who built it and what number that milestone is, or it refers to the building of bridges as well. Roman roads by the 2nd century AD, certainly in Italy and the Mediterranean, were paved. And they are these paved surfaces, which there are something like 100,000 miles of Roman roads, which we know of, so we might expect 200,000 miles in total. In looking at attitudes towards the roads, we might look at Cicero, who wrote during the Roman Republic, but he sees the road which goes through the north of Greece, through Macedonia, to the Hellespont, as fundamentally the Romans' road. It's our road. And also, when he's in exile from Rome, in Thessaloniki, he waits for news on the road because the road is where things are moving around. It's a busy thing, he describes it as, as in a letter. Now, these are marked in Latin always. Even in the Greek part of the Roman Empire and the Greek-speaking part of the Roman Empire, they are in Latin sometimes bilingual inscriptions. And we see this early on in the last instance on this slide where roads which had been under a king's name in the Attalid monarchy are then restored by Rome and marked by Roman milestones and Roman measurements. The conquest of space goes with the building of roads. Judea, conquered in the mid-first century AD, the first ever inscription to the Emperor Vespasian was this road milestone, which was set up by Trajan, the father of the future emperor. Now, this idea of making new roads has a sort of also has a corollary with sort of restoring roads as they become old. These two examples of milestones from the same road, milestones we think there should only be one, the Romans, if they restored a road, they added another one next to it. You can have as many 10 milestones at the same place. This new road from going inland in Algeria, some 68 kilometres, is restored about 100 years later, after it's become old and collapsed. Or it's also described as vetustate, which is this idea of ageing, something which is very old, more than 80 years old. And this idea of ageing and becoming old is written in to the very ideas of the Romans about their empire. Florus talks about how after more than 100 years to the emperor Trajan, Rome had become old. And it is Trajan who renews its youth and makes it more youthful so it may survive for longer. And we find this also written into the milestones of the Roman Empire. We see this when Trajan conquers Arabia, but then sets out a road through this space. He defines Arabia as a Roman province, but then sets out a road from the boundary of Syria to the Red Sea, which is not only opened, but is also paved. And by paving, he creates something which is new. So provinces are an area, but there is normally a road through them which defines them. We can think of all the Roman roads focused on the city of London, the city of Paris. These are all Roman cities created by Rome. If we're going to think through how important it was in the lives of the elite, the people who ran the empire, the senators, in their 20s, they can be involved in road building and road maintenance in the lowest office on the top. The four men are picked out each year in their 20s to run the streets of Rome and the streets outside Rome. In their 30s, when they're aediles, they can be responsible for the streets of the city and keeping them clean. As governors in their 30s or 40s of large areas of provinces, such as Britain or parts of Gaul, they are responsible for road building as part of their duties. And ultimately, in their 50s and, or older, they can be a curator of one of the famous roads of Italy, such as the Via Appia or the Via Flaminia. Hence, roads are written into the very idea of who is important in the state. Now, it wasn't just the roads, it's also the infrastructure which goes with it. Your ability to stay somewhere on the road, 
Now, there are various phrases for these. Sometimes they're called menciones, sometimes they're called mutationes, and sometimes they're called stationes in Latin. This inscription from Sagalassos in Turkey is an edict, refers to an edict by the governor who says who could stay in the mancio, the stopping place. And it lists out the three big authorities in the Roman state. The governor and his staff, the military personnel who may be passing through the province, and the emperor's slaves and freedmen. The emperor's slaves and freedmen are as much part of the state as everything else. Then it lists below that, we have a list of who could use the requisition transport. And we find the procurator and his son, another important person, military personnel again, senators who could be visiting the province, or Roman knights or equites on the service of the emperor, and then centurions on military service as well. So what we have in this document, which is written, inscribed in stone, is who is important, who runs the state, and who moves to run the state. So in many ways, Roman power is something which is devolved, it's networked, so that you have a complete network of power. Now finally, we want to sort of think through where this might lead, and to define five major research themes for the future. Firstly, we can see that roads are part of the infrastructure of the Roman state. If we understand that infrastructure, we can start to define how mobility worked and why the Roman state is such a phenomenon which includes the whole Mediterranean. We can also start looking at the places of power in the Roman state. And, for example, one of these stationes was dug up in Germany and we find that every six months the personnel moved because every six months a new group of people dedicate an altar to the genius of that place. It's a place where power is written. We can also see the Roman state as a distributed power network. In many ways, it doesn't have a centre. And this people find confusing who are used to the nation state or the feudal state. It's a state like no other. And this creates great problems in trying to define state power. Senatorial careers can be studied to see how they changed did they always work on Roman roads or did they go and do something else? Did all senators have experience of, in, of using infrastructure, creating infrastructure? Finally, we can start seeing the Roman state wearing out and the idea of infrastructure needing constant, constant renewal. And this is where we're, we're going towards and hopefully we will have a better idea in the future of how the Roman state works and its infrastructure. Thank you very much.